who was a local historian and a pilgrim expert named Sue Allen. sitting on a bench and I've got dead people all around me. I've got the tombs and the tombstones of people that had been there since the year 1200. It was funny because as I was talking with her, it almost felt like she was there. I felt like she knew these people, like they were friends of hers and she just brought them to life. When I think of pilgrims, I think of what I was taught in elementary school and history class. We think of pilgrims coming over in these funny black and white suits with big hats and belt buckles, <laughs> belt buckles on their shoes and, and uh, turkey guns. No, no, who, no. who were the pilgrims? Broadly speaking, they were part of the Puritan movement. And to really understand where they're coming from, you need to understand what a Puritan is. Yeah. Because for the first time, the Bible is printed in English and put into every church because until that point there were bibles in english being smuggled into the country and in their own life because this was god speaking to them and it got to a point that by 1593 there was an act against puritans brought in and under that law it became illegal to be a puritan anybody that disagreed with elizabeth's new church settlement got this name that you could spit out like a curse. Puritan. The state, the queen, the monarch, used the clergy as their mouthpiece to control you. And because of that, you had the government controlling the church and the church controlling the people. And so that's where you have the, the tyranny and the oppression that you can't get away from. And the thought is coming to them if this church can't be purified, they're going against the church and the king is the head of it. It's treason. So there was my first clue. The separatists were coming out from under the reign of Queen Elizabeth and into the rule of King James. And this guy was a tyrant king on steroids. He's the one who actually invented the phrase the divine right of kings. He bankrupted his nation, he tripled the debt, and he considered himself to be a devout Christian while he was obsessed with hunting down and destroying the most devout people in his land. But one of the things that fascinates me is knowing that once the Bible was translated into English and given to the common man, that changed everything because they started thinking for themselves. They said, this is what the word of God says. By one, they would come back to join their parents, their brothers and sisters, and the rest of their church family to worship God. Every time they opened up a Bible, they had to be looking over their shoulders, knowing that at any moment, the door could burst open and the army comes in and hauls you off to prison leaving your children and your wife destitute without anything. They knew that it brought them to a place where they had to make a choice. They said, either we're all in and we're gonna get caught eventually here, or we're going to make an escape, a strategic retreat out of England where we can continue to grow and develop as a community of faith and one day come back to England to set our September. It's cold. They're camping out. No tents, no sleeping bags. They're not even lighting a fire because the searchers might already be looking for them. Windy, cold, probably wet. When they suddenly see out this very flat landscape, a ship looming out. This ship that's going to take them to freedom. Unfortunately, the sea captain was also double dealing. He had made another agreement with the local authorities to capture the separatists and hand them over to them. And the deal was, if he would give them the pilgrims, the captain could keep all of their money. 
Well, the pilgrims had already sold everything that they had up until that point. They, they had no job. They sold their houses. They put our wives and kids in jeopardy, but they don't stop. They don't see that as a closed door. They see that as just one of the, they see those as battle wounds and scars and lessons that God is teaching them to prepare them for the next mission. What is the rocket fuel that pushes them to say failure is not final? They're not going, man, this stinks. They're saying, what's next? And they, they plan their next escape, not out of fear, but with excitement and passion and enthusiasm because they know that God has commissioned them and sent them on an assignment. They planned their next escape. And this time, it was potentially even more dangerous. The first time they went together on this boat, you remember everything I taught you. You take care of your mom. You take care of your sisters. These guys were all in. The problem was the women got here a day early and consequently were very seasick. So they came in to the shore where it was, you know, less movement. And the problem was they got caught right there on a mud bank. Horrors of horrors. Armed men closing in on the women. The women are helpless. They can't get out of the craft. It's stuck in the mud. They're sitting ducks. The men can't do anything. The women have got all the belongings, all the money. And the captain, when he sees the position, now this was dangerous because he and turned about and made their way to Holland, to Amsterdam. Because in that same storm, there were hundreds and hundreds of vessels lost. This one survived to tell the tale. How miraculous is that? Amazing. The story is getting amazing. I mean, here's a, a, a hundred ships get caught up in this storm and don't make it, but the ship with the pilgrims on it makes it to Holland. They don't have their wives and their kids. They're hoping that they'll meet up with them again. It's not until a year later I learned that they actually got their wives and kids over to Holland with them. This one survived to tell the tale. How miraculous is that? Yeah, this is not the story that I heard growing up in school. Um, quiet little religious fuddy-duddies scurry out of England with their tail between their legs and come to America not knowing how to plant corn uh, or fend for themselves. No, they actually planned to go somewhere where they could find spiritual freedom so that they could return to England and set their people free with what they were learning. And Holland was the place for that. Uh, there was a town called Leiden where they regrouped for 12 years as a congregation. In Leiden, I met with one of my good friends and the president of the World History Institute, Dr. Marshall. Of, of their England that they left behind, that was under the divine right tyrant, King James. And they wanted to bring them the liberty of the gospel. And so they set up a printing press in William Brewster's home. And that press was the internet of the day. It was the way to go around the censorship of the king and to get the truth of the gospel to the people of England and Scotland. And so they produced over 15 books and then put them in kegs and sent them in ships secretly over to England and Scotland. And it went all over the country. Well, James was really excited about that. In fact, he spent the next year and a half tracking this down. And finally, he found out that it was the Pilgrim Press in Leiden that had published these books. The troops came in, broke down the printing press, and took the seal of the King of England and sealed the home so no one these people had the faith to lay their lives down in the wilderness 400 years ago. They had to put their children to work, many times just to eat. They were barely surviving. Troops came in, broke down the printing press. They came to propagate the gospel of Christ to the remotest parts of the world. on them, a 
to this point, right? They're meeting in secret. They escape for the first time. They get caught, thrown into prison. They escape a second time, get separated from their wives and children. They try to make it in Holland. That's not working out. So they get on a ship, go back to England. The first ship springs a leak. They've got to go back again. At what point do you say, enough? We get it. This is not part of the plan. enough room for all of the passengers on the remaining Mayflower, they hold a meeting and they realize that this family of pilgrims that had been together for 12 years under the loving leadership of their pastor, John Robinson, will likely never see half of his family ever again, trusting that what he had taught them, the seeds that he had planted in their hearts and their mind would bear fruit in a land that he would never visit for the sake of their children and their grandchildren while he stayed behind and helped those who were trying to survive in Holland. That's a different kind of Christian. Someone who plants seeds today, not for their own benefit, but to provide opportunity and blessing and prosperity for their children and their children's children. And they're willing to sacrifice everything now in order to give that gift to them. Because they know that they can ultimately stand on the promises of God and be... What he travels in September, October, November on the North Atlantic in the 16th century. You're crazy. But they did. And as they took off in the fall of 1620, not knowing that their three-week journey was going to be a eight-week journey that was going to take 66 days. So what was it like on the boat? Uh, well, if you can imagine constant gales in the North Atlantic on a little boat like this, and having a boat with, with no, nothing to protect the water from going down underneath. So in that one deck that is below the main upper deck, you basically have it four, four and a half feet high. You've got 102 people crammed in there. They're going back and forth at a 45 degree angle. They're all huddled together. Water is pouring down on their head. So they're constantly wet. They're barfing. Their children are barfing. They've got constant sickness and disease. They've got everybody going to the bathroom and trying to hide this. Because it's worth it. I mean, what kind, what kind of character do you have to have to do something like that with your family? I mean, you're either crazy or you've got courage and you've got faith. These are the real people that founded America. And they were real. Were they perfect? No. Did they cry out and scream, I'm sure, in fear? Did they, uh, were they afraid? Yes, they were. But, but they carried on and persevered. In fact, William Bradford, their governor, said, if we are to lose our lives in this endeavor, at least we know that our cause is just and our cause is honorable. So their perspective was, do the right thing over the long haul. And in the long run, God will bless it. This could have been the most tragic mistake. And with one another, in a document that is now known as the Mayflower Compact. And they did this while they were still on the boat. So I met with Dr. Paul Jaley, the president of the Plymouth Rock Foundation, to help me understand the real significance of the Mayflower Compact. They come into agreement, saint and stranger, those from the Church of England, those from the separatists, they join together in 